Hi, welcome to this third installment of uh, our, my lectures for assignment eight from After Capitalism, David Schweikert's After Capitalism. Uh, we left off last time uh, having posed uh, Marx's question and David Schweikert's question. And the question is basically, uh, well, there's, there's really two ways of framing it. Uh, and I think they're just tightly connected, these two questions. One question is, why should we have capitalists in our economy at all? And remember, capitalists is someone who can derive uh, a comfortable living simply off of their capital investments uh, in the economy, as opposed to someone who derives a living by, say, you know, uh, laboring, you know, working for a wage of some sort. Uh, so one question is, why should we have capitalists in our economy? Why, why should we have that sort of thing, uh, that role uh, in the economy? Why should that even be a possibility? Remembering that it's the laws that create the market that creates the possibility of capitalist. We have we have a policy choice, a legal choice, whether we're going to um, create this thing, this possibility, uh, capitalist uh, in our legal scheme. Uh, so that's one question. Another question that's tightly connected to it is, is it justified for the capitalist to get uh, her return on her investment, that, that amount of return that you get, uh, just simply for, uh, from passively investing some capital property? Those two questions are connected. Uh, and in uh, this last uh, um, mini lecture, I'm going to consider, uh, an, uh, well, I'm going to rehearse uh, Schweikert's discussion of four different reasons that we might uh, offer uh, for answering those questions in the affirmative, uh, you know, and saying, yes, here's the reason why we need to have capitalists. Yes, this, these are the reasons why uh, the capitalist return on uh, their investment is uh, morally justified. Uh, and here I list, you know, just to organize the four basic answers. And I'm just going to go over them briefly. I'm going to point them out to you. Uh, one is that we need entrepreneurs. Uh, the second is that the capitalist puts her money at risk and she's entitled to this income. Third, to, uh, we need to have capitalists because uh, having that role uh, where someone can get a reward for investing is a way of uh, promoting savings in the economy that we need. Uh, to generate economic productivity and growth. And the fourth is to is that, look, there's no alternative, there's no other political economic system that can do nearly as good of a job getting us uh, the dynamic economic growth that we need as capitalism. Now, these are huge issues, and you know Schweikart does not pretend to definitively resolve them. He's ultimately going to give reasons for rebutting each of these arguments. And then in his chapter three and four, he's going to propose an alternative political economy that he argues can do at least as well as capitalism when it comes to driving entrepreneurial activity uh, in the economy. Uh, but even Schweiker himself admits that his treatment in this book is, no, is by no means dispositive of this issue, but he is making a case uh, that we don't need capitalists, we don't need capitalism, there's another possibility. Ultimately, he's going to argue for a democratically governed uh, uh, socialist uh, successor system to capitalism. And we'll talk more about that next time. But, now, but right now, let's just talk about the reasons that I've enumerated here for, uh, uh, that, that defend, that are, that are apologies for this, cap, this capitalist uh, form of economy. Um, so the first one is that we need entrepreneurs. So we need the capitalist system because we because that's how we get entrepreneurs. Uh, we, the capitalists are our entrepreneurs. And here, uh, being true to philosophical form, uh, uh, David Schweiker says, look, we need to make a conceptual distinction here. Uh, we cannot uh, conflate two different concepts. Uh, but first, let's make the argument. Let's just state the argument here in this top uh, paragraph. The entrepreneur sees an opportunity, rushes to take advantage of it, thereby benefiting not only himself but society at large. The entrepreneur develops a new product, invents a new technology. And then here, uh, Schweikert goes on, no one can doubt that the entrepreneur makes a productive contribution. Uh, and then he says, entrepreneurial activity is vital for capitalism and for successor system socialism, what he's going to defend. Socialism will need entrepreneurs, but he's going to say it doesn't need passive capitalists. Uh, his punchline is this. Look, true to philosophical form, he makes a conceptual distinction. He says, look, a capitalist is one thing. Someone who can make an investment and sit back and uh, reap the returns on that investment an entrepreneur is another. Those are two different uh, activities. Those are two different roles. Uh, 
And then he points out that most income derived from a capital investment has nothing to do with ongoing entrepreneurial agency. Uh, the, and so he says, look, we need to be very careful not to misleadingly conflate the entrepreneurial function from the capitalist function. And as a matter of fact, most capitalists are not entrepreneur. And then he backs this up a little bit, and he points out, look, in 2009, personal interest income totaled uh, $1.2 trillion. That, that's a huge chunk of uh, the American gross domestic product. Uh, and and that, that's $1.2 uh, trillion dollars American. Interest income is the income you receive for having made a loan. And, you know, what he's saying is, look, these are capital loans. Uh, and then another $705 billion was paid out as dividend income to shareholders of their wholly passive contributions to production. Now, the idea is that, look, when you make a loan, you get interest back, and all that is is a passive uh, return on your loan. You're not doing anything. You've made the loan, and you get the interest back. Uh, when you get dividend income, you're not doing anything. You're getting dividends from a corporation that you hold stock in, uh, that you've probably you know, that you've bought through you know if you're through some uh, uh, stockbroker, maybe a really complex, powerful stockbroker uh, that very wealthy people deal with, uh, or very wealthy corporations deal with, or it might be a you know a less sophisticated stockbroker like down you know uh, uh, on the corner you know down the street on Dundas or something like that. But the idea is that of almost two trillion dollars in 2009, I mean, I was, uh, were was the, was uh, passive income received. You know, it was received by folks who did nothing but make loans or get the returns from investing in uh, in stock. Uh, this uh, this uh, Schweiker points out is a mind-boggling total for one year. If this 1.9 trillion had been distributed equally, every household in the United States would have received $16,000 from these sources that year. Uh, and that's a big deal when you consider, and um, this is something I went and looked up, the 2009 household median income was $57,000. So uh, that would have increased, well, let me first say what a median income is. A median income is, say you, you, you line up every single, all the households in the United States, and, uh, and, and by the way, a household will typically be uh, a, a pair of spouses and one, and so, somewhere between one and two kids. So for every unit like that, the median income is $57,000. You line up all, the, the median is if you line up all of the household units in one gigantic line, you know, stretching all the way across the United States or something, the median income is the income of the person that's in the middle of that line. Where if that line starts with the very poorest household to the very richest on the other side, the median income uh, would be the household that falls right there in the middle uh, of that line. Uh, so if it was uh, a, a line of just 100 people, you know, the United States is much bigger than that, but it was a, it was a line of 100 households, uh, the 50th richest household would be the would have this income, median income of $57,000.10. Uh, and if, if they got, if every household got, uh, you know, received the interest that was allocated to the very... Uh, to, to the capitalists in the society, which remember are going to be a very small sliver of the society that's you know, reaping these incomes, uh, re reaping reaping this 1.9 trillion dollars. If uh, ordinary people got this, then it would increase the, that median income uh, by you know a quarter or more than a more than a quarter actually. Okay, so that's a that's a big deal amount of money, and that's a lot of money that's being made for folks where all they did was uh, give their money not uh, uh, as a loan. Or as a, uh, 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 yeah, as a loan or as an investment in equity in the form of stock. Okay. Now, so uh, so anyway, we the, the idea. So to to summarize, this first thing that Schweiker considers, this first justification for the capitalist role, this justification for having capitalists who are able to. Uh, uh, achieve uh, income just from passive investment, significant amounts of income, as we've now seen, is that we need entrepreneurs. And what he points out is, look, the capitalist function and the entrepreneurial function are completely separate. Those are two separate things. And in fact, most entrepreneurs, most capitalists are not entrepreneurs. They just sit back and 
uh, get these passive incomes without any involvement in the company uh, or the economic, um, the day-to-day -day economic production. Okay, the second is that the capitalist puts her money at risk. This is a so Schweikert considers this claim at, at length. The idea is that the capitalist is entitled to her return on her investment because she put her money at risk, and because she took that risk, she's entitled to the return. Schweikert, this is for, for me is probably the least satisfying uh, section of this chapter. Uh, this is actually an extended discussion, and uh, the, to my mind, this discussion meanders a bit. Uh, and I struggled to figure out, okay, what is the heart of this section? Uh, and I'm actually going to omit quite a bit of what goes on in that section. I'm just going to put to what seems to me to be the clearest, most direct response to this, is that, look, uh, uh, it is not, this isn't actually a very good argument for saying, for defending uh, the fa defending the return uh, that capitalists get. So the argument is, look, the capitalists are entitled to the return on their income because they took a risk uh, by uh, investing their income in something. They could have lost all that money, but they took a risk, and so they should get that money back. And the point is, I think, uh, I think this is just a devastating response, is that, look, the fact that someone took some sort of risk uh, in, uh, you know, doing, in doing something that uh, yield a return of income for them, that is not in itself a justification for them getting that return on income. Uh, for example, a robber puts his life at risk when he robs someone, uh, but that clearly does not justify the economic return that the robber gets on that, uh, that endeavor. So the, it's just a really simple point here. Look, it's not, it's not really to the point to say that the capitalists should get their money in you know, this return that they get because, well, they put their money at risk. That's, that's just not the right kind of thing to justify you know, <laughs> getting the return that you're risk-taking uh, uh, realized for you. Um, I think when people make this kind of argument, they actually have uh, uh, the, the next two arguments in mind, or the, the, the next immediately following argument in mind. Here's the idea. Look, um, the capitalists should get their money back because we need to incentivize people to save uh, be, uh, and to invest. Uh, we need to incentivize people to save and then invest those funds to generate economic pr productivity and growth. And the best way to do that is to have this role of capitalists where people can take risks in the hope of, uh, 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 you know, with their saved investment and the, and the hope of getting returns themselves. And in that way, that's going to help everybody because that's going to just generate, you know, these economic uh, opportunities. It's going to give uh, entrepreneurs the capital that they need to pursue these, uh, these dynamic economic opportunities. And so the model here is something like this. Look, for, to get dynamic economic growth, what you need to have is you need to have a group of frugal savers out there. And to have that, you have to incentivize them, and that's what this capitalist role does. We put a capitalist role into the economic system so that we'll incentivize the savings, uh, and th that saving will enable investment, That uh, and that investment will, uh, will fund these dynamic entrepreneurs, and then we'll get our economic growth. That's the way we've got to do this. Uh, this is how we get the dynamic economic economy that we all want. Remember that guy John Maynard Keynes, the mid-20th century uh, economist that I quoted uh, earlier uh, in an earlier lecture? Uh, John Maynard Keynes, I'll just say this as a side point, he is, he is associated as sort of like the brain of the 1945 to 1980 version of capitalism, that great compression capitalism. Uh, he's, if you haven't heard of him, he's really a big deal in economics, uh, and he's most closely associated with this uh, post-World War II economic regime that uh, governed uh, most of the world, and particularly countries like uh, the United States, European countries, and Canada, uh, certainly from that 1945 to 1980 period before Reagan and Thatcher. 
there's John Maynard Keynes uh, has this counter story, and it's a counter story that Schweikert buys that he believes is true. And I should say, as an aside, this is a counter story that is, I think, now pretty close to conventional uh, conventional wisdom now amongst economists. I don't know if that's quite right, but this is certainly a, a, a the, the, there's a, this is a powerful camp today. It's sort of a resurgent camp today. And what this counter story says is uh, encapsulated here on page 44 by Schweikert. He says, and with, with this passage, Schweikert's like saying, look, saving is not the only way to fund economic growth and entrepreneurial activity. He says, so, so here he gives us an example. So, suppose instead of waiting for a frugal saver to accumulate funds to finance an entrepreneurial opportunity, the government simply prints the money and lends it to her. Why can't why can't we fund entrepreneurial activity that way? The government simply prints the money. Uh, Schreckert then goes on to say, look, he's not actually recommending that we fund entrepreneurial activity that way, but he's pointing, and, and in chapter three, he actually gives us an alternative way of funding uh, entrepreneurial activity that isn't simply the government printing money. But, he, but here, by delivering this Keynesian counter story, uh, he says, here's the key point. Uh, business credit is necessary to get the entrepreneurial activity going that we want in a dynamic economy. But savings is only one means to this end. Savings is just one way to skin this cat. There might be other ways, uh, other than savings, to uh, uh, produce to, to create the, the funding structure for entrepreneurial activity. Chapter three, he's going to give us this an alternative funding structure that is neither private savings mediated through a capitalist economy, nor is it just simply the government printing money. It's something that he thinks of as more responsible. Um, but the key point, once again, is uh, business credit is necessary to fund entrepreneurial growth, but savings is only one way of doing it, other ways of doing it. Uh, and then he adds, as a kicker, uh, savings, you know, this savings can actually be problematic in an economy like ours. An economy like the Canadian economy and the United States economy and a lot of uh, economies today, they're consumption driven. So the idea is that entrepreneurs, they look for things that consumers want. That's how they get their opportunities going. That's how they get their dynamic economy going. They need for there to be these consumption driven opportunities. Savings can be uh, in tension with that dynamic or aspect of the economy because any consumer who saves their money instead of spending it is is now not uh, is now not <coughs> a potential target for uh, the entrepreneur because this person has no money that they're willing to spend on new uh, uh, products produced by these entrepreneurs <coughs> So the idea is that saving can actually be problematic if it uh, suppresses demand in the economy, undercutting entrepreneurial potential. Okay, so here is so now I think we've at least gotten the general idea of Schweikert's response to this claim that look we need the capitalist role in order to promote savings. His big response is look savings is only one way to. Uh, get the entrepreneurial growth we want. And so if there's other ways to get that entrepreneurial growth, then we don't need to promote savings and we don't need to have the capitalist role in order to do that. That's the general, that's the general idea. Finally, uh, and here, this is his, the shortest section uh, in his chapter two, and it's Tina. There's no alternative to capitalism. And the basic idea is that, look, there's no other way to get the entrepreneurial activity for a dynamic economy other than this basic capitalist structure with privately owned, with capitalists who own uh, you know, the means of production and reap returns on their ownership of these, of, of these capital factors of production. Uh, and so, and the idea is that like a large and robust saver driven private fund and capitalist owned economy is the only way to go we want to sustain dy dynamic economic growth. Schweikert says that is the argument. That is the main argument that someone that uh, rejects capitalism 
uh, and rejects the role of capital, has to deal with. His chapter three is to say, uh, well, here's my, I'm going to propose a successor system. I'm going to propose a system that isn't driven uh, by private funding and by a capitalist-owned economy where only a thin sliver of the population owns uh, all the capital. I'm going to give you a different idea, and I'm going to explain why we have reason to believe that this will be a highly dynamic economy. But the proof is in the pudding, and we will uh, eat that pudding, Chapter 3, and a little bit of Chapter 4, uh, 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 next time. Thanks a lot for your time.